Good morning. Welcome to Christian Community Church. Thank you for joining us online and tuning in and being a part of it. Uh, even though we are separated by distance, we are the Church of God. And we have the privilege of being able to gather together virtually or in any other way that God permits and the Spirit can work in the midst of it. So thank you for tuning in and joining us this morning. We pray that you are blessed by the time that we have. Uh, we're going to do worship here with Kelly, but before we get started, I was going to do one scripture. This is the one that David preached on last week for Easter, and it's a great call to praise. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So that's the hope that we have and that we get to celebrate and rejoice that no matter what's going on in the world, our hope is in Jesus Christ. So let's take this time and get refocused on him and give him the glory. Good morning, church. Let's worship in song. Mm -hmm. 
Father, we do just thank you, Father, for your grace and for your love. And Lord, just thank you for worship where we can get our eyes back on you again, Lord. And just thank you, Lord, that we don't have to live in fear, Father God, that we aren't slaves to fear. For God, Father, you've given us a better way than that, Lord. You've given us your son, Jesus, and in him we have hope. So, Lord, even as we sang about today, Lord God, that we would turn our eyes to you and our focus to you, Lord Jesus, that we wouldn't live in fear, Father God, because our eyes are fixed on you and because our hope is on you, Lord. And just help us to keep it there in the midst of all the news that we hear and the chaos around us, Father, and our own frustrations and challenges that we're, and trials that we're going through personally and as a family. Lord, just help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus. For you are our hope and you are our life and you are our strength, Lord. So I just pray that you would turn us to you, Father God, continually and always, Lord Jesus, that you would be our fountain of life, Father, and that you would be our source of hope always, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody virtually said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, CCC family and friends. Let's look to the word today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We are back in our series in Ephesians, brought to life and brought together. Let me just give you a recap if you remember. Chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians describe what God has done for us. And chapters 4 through 6 of Ephesians talk about living that out. Or as Paul says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, walking worthy. And we're looking at walking worthy in holiness. If you remember in verses 1 through 16, Paul talked about walking worthy meant living in unity as the body of Christ. And now in the rest of chapter 4 and in, actually in chapter 5 and 6, he talks about walking worthy and what that means in life or walking worthy in holiness of life. And so uh, we're going to be in verses 17 through 24 of chapter 4. So chapter 4 verses 17 through 24. The passage can be broken up really into two sections, verses 17 through 19, describe or Paul's challenge to the Ephesians to no longer live as unbelievers, that is live in the uh, futility of their minds because they've been freed from that futility. And then verses 20 through 24, Paul talks about fleeing that life of futility by striving to walk or to live a life of holiness, which we'll see he describes as obedience to Christ. So I want to read verses 17 through 24 of chapter 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off the old self, which it belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. If you were deathly ill or had an illness, and you sought treatment from a physician that you knew that you trusted and respected, and you went into his office, and he did an examination, and at the end of that examination, he gives you uh, his diagnosis. And his diagnosis is grim. It says that you have a fatal disease that if, unless you deal with it, unless you take care of it, you are going to die. I imagine if you trusted that physician, if you respected him, you would listen to what he had to say to resolve or to remedy your illness. And he, and he said, even though this disease is fatal, there is a way out. There is a way to escape this. There is a way to overcome this. And he gives you a prescription. And if you were wise and if you trusted him and you respected him, you would follow that prescription because most of us don't want to die. 
Well, Paul says today, uh, as a physician of, of the human condition, Paul gives us a grim diagnosis. And he tells us that we can find freedom from this grim diagnosis. Because when we come to faith in Christ, he says that we have been freed from a life of futility. And so we must flee from that life of futility. Because we have been freed from that life of futility, we have to flee from that life of futility. So let's pray and then we'll look at the text. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true. I thank you, Lord, that it, it, it helps to shape our minds, shape our hearts, and shape our lives. And so we ask, Lord, that you would come by the work of your spirit and the gift of teaching and preaching and that your spirit would bring light to our minds and heat to our hearts, Lord, that we would uh, not just be informed, not just be inspired, but that we'd be transformed by the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the two things, that, the two truths that I want to share with you today. The first truth is in verses 17 through 19. And that truth is that we've been freed from a life of futility. And then in verses 20 through 24, we are encouraged or commanded to flee from that life of futility. And we're going to focus today on verses 17 through 19 and then 20 through 21. We're not going to get through 22 through 24. We'll focus on those next week. And so let's look at uh, my first point, which is free. we've been freed from a life of futility in verses 17 through 19. Paul starts out challenging the Ephesian church, is to, and he says, stop living as the Gentiles do. That is, stop living as unbelievers. And what the reason why Paul says is that evidently in the church, there were those that were in the church who were not working, uh, who were not living worthy of the calling that they have received. They weren't living in holiness, or they weren't walking in obedience. And Paul's point is, is that because we've been freed from a life of futility, we are to flee from that futility. And the futility he describes in grim terms. If you listen to secular humanists, they would tell us that uh, humans are basically good. I found one of the, or some of the uh, founding values of eBay. And this was given by, by the founders of eBay in 1992. And, it's, and this is the values that they built eBay upon. Some of them were actually are great values, but the first one is one that I want to read to you. It says, we believe that people are basically good. Well, unfortunately, the Bible describes humanity in not so glowing terms. The Bible describes humanity in darker terms that even some secular uh, humanists will recognize do recognize. Beatrice Webb was one of the architects of the modern British welfare system. She and her husband founded the London School of Economics. She was a socialist, an activist, and a reformer. And in 1925, she went back and read her old diaries. And this is what she writes about as she reflected back on those old diaries. In my diary in 1890, I wrote, I have stalked all the essential I'm sorry, I have staked all on the essential goodness of human nature. But now, 35 years later, I realize how permanent are the civil, evil impulses and instincts in us, and how little they seem to change, like greed for wealth and power, and how mere social machinery will never change that. We must ask better things of human nature, but will we get a response? No amount of knowledge or science has been of any avail. Listen to her statement. No amount of knowledge or science has been to any avail. That is, it hasn't helped human nature. And unless we curb the bad impulse, how will we get better social institutions? So she's saying that she used to believe in the essential goodness of human nature. But she came to recognize that there's something wrong with us that leads to corruption that is consistent across history, and nothing seems to change that. Now, when the Bible describes humanity in dark terms, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that uh, all people are equally bad or 
that all people are as bad as they could be, but what it means is that the is that sin has so corrupted and tainted every aspect of human nature that there's nothing within us that has not been corrupted by sin. It's, it's like if you took a clear glass of water and you put a drop of dye in it, that drop of dye would permeate all the water. So the water would change from clear to the color of that dye. Sin has so corrupted human nature that there is nothing within us that hasn't been corrupted or tainted by sin. And then Paul starts to describe unbelievers this way. He says that they are living in the futility of their minds in verse 17. Human life is futile apart from God's purposes that are found only in Christ. This is similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. For though they knew God, that is, they knew God existed, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, the same language that Paul's using in Ephesians, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fool and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Unbelievers can accomplish so much good apart from God, but if, I'm sorry, unbelievers can accomplish so much good, and we see unbelievers accomplish so much good over the course of history, but apart from God's saving knowledge and God's eternal purposes, those acts and those good things that they did are ultimately meaningless. Because life outside of God is ultimately meaningless. And what, what I mean is that it's futile in the sense that if we put all of our time and our energy into doing, doing all these things outside of Christ as human beings, and in the end, and in eternity, they're meaningless. It's like if you found a piece of property that you loved, and you designed a house, in, in great detail, spent a lot of time and energy de designing the best house you could, then you bought all the best materials that you could, and then you built the best house that you could, and then you're starting to enjoy this, and by the time you, by the time you can enjoy this house on this beautiful property, someone comes along and tells you that you don't own that property. So everything you have done has been futile because the property doesn't even belong to you. And that's a picture of life with outside of God, is that you can build an incredible life, but in the end, it's, it is meaningless because it has no eternal purpose and you are not connected to the author of life. So apart from the life-giving and eye-opening work of the Spirit, we're all dead in our trespasses and sin. Paul says that, Paul goes on to say or to embellish on this futility. He says, first of all, that unbelievers are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God. Verse 18. And what he means there is that all of us are born spiritually blind and alienated from the life of God so that we cannot see spiritual realities because we are spiritually dead. And as I said earlier, sin has so corrupted and permeated human nature that we are blind to all spiritual truth. And as I said earlier, it is apart from life-giving and eye-opening work of the Spirit, we're all dead in our sins. That is, we, we deny and we do not acknowledge God. So no matter how healthy, how active, how happy, how productive people are, all of us are who are <clears throat> all of us are born severed from the life of God and are blinded to our truth. But Paul's diagnosis runs deeper. He gives two reasons for our darkness and our alienation. The darkness is because of the ignorance that is in us that is due to the hardness of our hearts. 
So this ignorance that Paul describes is not for a lack of knowledge or a lack of truth. The human heart is hardened towards God. The human heart has hardened itself towards the knowledge of God that is available to us. And so we are ignorant because we instinctively suppress the truth of God. Have you ever, have you ever did not want to believe in something so badly you would not and you refused to believe it only to find out later that it was true? And as you examined your heart, examined your motive, you recognized that you wanted so badly not to believe some truth about somebody, you refused to believe it. That's what Paul describes the human heart that is hard towards God. We instinctively, because we don't want to, instinctively we suppress the truth. So instead of embracing the truth about God, human nature creates gods in our own likeness, in our own image, that, is, that are like us, that agree with us, and that is, accept us the way we are. But think about it. Do, do you, has, have you ever had a relationship with another person who would accept you just the way you are without expecting you to change and who would agree with you and everything that you ever said? We, we never have any relationships that always agree with us and always accept us the way we are because that's not a healthy relationship. But the human mind, the human heart, wants to create a God that will accept us the way we are and that will embrace the truths that we believe. And so that is ultimately just creating a God in our own image. And then Paul moves from the inner life of the unbeliever to how the unbeliever lives in verse 19. He describes the hard heart being manifested in callousness and giving ourselves over to sensuality in verse 19. Callousness is an insensitivity or a numbness towards sin and God, not necessarily towards all sin, but towards sin in general. Do you ever remember having callous as a kid? Every year when I, get, when I uh, pick up fishing again, I get calluses on my knuckles. But when I was a kid, you know, I would play uh, baseball or I'd play sports, and in the summer I would get these calluses on my, uh, inside on my palm. And when I was a kid, we used to stick needles through those calluses because we, and we couldn't feel them because we were not because that skin was numb. That's what Paul is talking about here: that the callousness of our own heart, that we are numb towards God and numb towards sin. So we give ourselves up to sensuality, which is removing all restraint, all sense of self-control, and living for our senses and our desires that drive us. And then Paul goes on to describe that the purpose of giving ourselves up to sensuality is that we become greedy or we are greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is, we have no self desire to restrain or self-control to restrain our own morality not just normal things that we think are bad but even the ways and means by which we accomplish those things our life become the means by which we accomplish those sinful actions I can think of a lot of different ways we do that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the uh, most extreme example would be just recently with uh, the Harvey Weinstein, uh, um, Weinstein, I'm sorry, the Harvey Weinstein. In his trial recently, he talked about, you know, he, Harvey Weinstein was the, really the, the, the person who created the Me Too movement. Uh, because of uh, the way he took advantage of many, many women over the course of his career. And here's what happened, is that those people that were surrounding Harvey Weinstein and allowing him and, in, and helping him to do all those evil things he did with women, taking advantage of women, they made it possible 
for him to do that until he was found out. Then all of a sudden, they changed their tune and they moved away from Harvey Weinstein and Harvey was left all along. Even at his trial, the courtroom was empty besides reporters. And when he was given an opportunity after his sentencing to talk, to, to uh, give any kind of a sense of remorse or uh, just a statement, he talked about his truth. And he talked about how he felt bad for all the men that were going to be affected by the Me Too movement. So even in his brokenness, even in his, even in his sentencing, he was still feeling, rem he, had, he was actually feeling sorry for himself and painting a picture of himself as being a victim of his circumstances. In the recent COVID pandemic, one of the scams that has gone around is people creating uh, COVID virus testing kits that they're selling. And they're meaningless kits, they're false kits, but it's just a way for people to profit from circumstances and situations with people. The prisoners that have been left out, I just read a report or an article about a prisoner who, would let, who was let out and he ended up actually killing somebody. And then another manifestation of the hardness of heart and the callousness towards sin is and uh, human depravity would be the government overstepping its boundaries uh, in recent days. Well, Paul says that the only way that you and I can escape this futility is the gospel. That is, fleeing from sin and fleeing from this futility and fleeing towards Christ. And if we're Christians and God has made us alive, we have, he, he says we have been freed from this futility. Christ has freed us from this futility. And so he tells us in verses 20 to 21 to flee this life of futility. Futility that he's been talking about is ultimately meaningless in the picture of, re of eternity. In, in light of looking at life from re eternity, living your life just from this temporary short perspective, he says, is futile. So we've seen first that we have been freed from a life of futility. And now let's look at what Paul has to say in verses 20 through 21. Flee from a life of futility. Listen to what Paul says in verses 20 and 21. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus When Paul starts out in verse 20, he says, but, and he's drawing a contrast. He's saying, do not live a life of futility as an unbeliever, but instead live as a believer, live as a follower of Christ. And when, call, when Christ calls us to follow him, when he was preaching then and when we're preaching now, the call to follow Christ is a call to repent of our sin, that is to turn away from our sin, to turn away from a life of futility and turn towards Christ in faith, coming to him for salvation that is only found in Christ. And this repentance and turning towards Christ is not just a one-time act. It's not just something we do once, but it's a daily commitment. It's a daily lifestyle of repenting from our sin and turning towards Christ to save us from our sin. Because our struggle to follow Christ, to walk in holiness, to walk in obedience, is a struggle that is a daily fight, a fight for holiness. The New Testament picture of a disciple is that there's an expectation that we will become like Christ, which could be really just summarized as Christ walking in faith towards the Father and walking in love towards others, or following the Father in faith and walking in obedience to the Father. <clears throat> 
So if we have been made alive, that like Paul describes in chapter 2 of Ephesians, if the Spirit of Christ within us, we have the power of Christ available to us, so the expectation is that we will progressively become like Christ. When Paul writes the phrase, that is not the way you have learned Christ, what he's describing is being a student of Christ, being a disciple of Christ, that is being in relationship to Christ, putting yourself under his teaching, and obeying him as a rabbi, or in this our case, as a as Lord. What are you a student of right now? If I was to say to you, okay, so, so what, are, what are you a student of right now? What are you giving your time and attention to? What are you studying right now? Some of you, it would be learning about everything you need to know about your upcoming fishing season. Some of you are students, so you'd be saying, well, I'm learning my classes. I'm taking my online classes. Some of you are students of history, and so you'd say, well, I'm reading about World War II history, or I'm reading about the Civil War history, or I'm just reading about, about uh, American history. Some of you are interested in the COVID virus, and so you're reading all the news about the COVID virus. You're reading all about the virus, all about the research that's being done towards uh, a vaccine or an antibody. Jesus calls us, our first priority of study and of being a student is to be a student of Jesus. That is to learn about him, to sit under his teaching and obey his teaching. And so let me encourage you that if Jesus is not your number one, if he's not your number one object of study, then you need to look at your life to turn your life towards him being the number one object of your study. Following Christ is modeled by the early disciples, the 12 disciples, that as they followed, around, followed him around, they built a relationship with him, they sat under his teaching, and then they were expected and they obeyed him as they grew in their knowledge and following him. Now, we don't follow him like they did, but the principle is still the same, is that we put ourselves under his teaching, we build a relationship with him, and we obey him, and we embrace his mission. Even the larger group of disciples that were following Jesus, larger than the 12, took his serious, teaching seriously. They gave themselves to his teaching, they sat under his teaching, and they obeyed him and embraced his mission. One of the most famous incidents of women with Jesus is the story of Martha and Mary, where Martha is in the kitchen doing all the busy work, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to his teaching. And it's so often that that passage is talked about Martha being a busybody, and Mary being one who was at Jesus' feet. And that's true to some extent, but the, the larger context of that passage is all about discipleship. Martha was distracted with the duties of life, neglecting the opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet, because sitting at Jesus' feet was a picture of Mary coming under Jesus' teaching, listening to, her, listening to his teaching, to embrace his teaching, and following him as one of his disciples. Too many falsely believe today that obeying Jesus is optional, but in the very command that we're given to make disciples, it says to teach them to make disciples. I'm sorry. Making disciples is teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded them. So it's not just teaching for information. Information is good. Information is great. But the purpose of information is not just information alone, but it's to learn to obey and to follow Jesus. Jesus.
Actually, the New Testament, New Testament teaches, ab, um, teaches the opposite. The New Testament understanding is the expectation is that if we're following Jesus, we will obey Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And I just want to read just a couple of verses that I think uh, summarize the teaching of the New Testament what it means to follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 7. I want to read verses 15 through 27. It's kind of a long passage, but I think it's important just to look at what Jesus' expectation is of following him. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, that is, they look like Christians, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every tree that bears, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. What he's saying is that a true prophet, or let's just say a true teacher, you will know them by the fruit. And we can describe fruit as the fruit of obedience, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of reflecting Christ-like character. And he says, ultimately, a, a test of a true prophet or a true teacher is not necessarily what they say, but how do they live in following Christ? Are they, do they have fruit in their life? And then in verse 21, Jesus says, uh, really kind of applies it uh, what he's been saying to the disciples. And he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then it goes on to describe those who do great acts of ministry. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In verses 21 through 23, the point is this. True followers of Jesus will obey Jesus. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about you. true followers of Jesus have their lives transformed so they become like Jesus. And then verses 24 through 27, basically it's just a, it's a picture of a man who builds his house on the rock, who builds his house on sand. And the man who builds his, rock, uh, his house on the rock, the, when the storms of life come, his house stands. But a man who builds his house on the sand, when the storms of life come, his house is washed away. And this is what Jesus says. Every man then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What he's saying is that those whose lives are built on obedience to Christ, by faith in Christ, are those who are genuine followers of Christ. So the New Testament teaching can be summed up as this way. is that since you've been freed from futility, flee from that futility and flee towards Christ. What Jesus taught was that following him was a life of submitting yourselves to his teaching and a life of obedience, which we'll look at specifically next week in verses 20 through, 22 through 24. And I want to talk about how Jesus and how Paul describes that we can change. Change, walking in holiness, walking in obedience, is a struggle for every one of us. If we're honest with ourselves and if, we're, and if we're striving to follow Christ faithfully. And sometimes we wonder, can I really change? But the good news is, is that we can change because God has made us alive. He's given us his spirit. He's given us, his power is available to us. And what he calls us to do is to look to him in faith to find strength to walk a life of holiness and a life of obedience. And so let me encourage you today. Paul has given us, a, 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 as, a, as a great physician, as a, 
expert physician has given us a grim look of human nature that is a life of futility. And if you have never put your faith in Christ, let me encourage you to, to flee from that futility. That is to turn away from the unbelief in your own heart. Turn away from your sin and turn towards Christ in faith to receive salvation. And if you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in Christ, here is the promise, is that you and I have been freed from this futility. So therefore, flee from this futility because you and I can find freedom from this futility. We can find freedom from our sin in the struggles that we have. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have freed us from futility. So Lord, I just pray for grace and power, the power of your spirit to flee from this futility and to live a life of obedience, a life of holiness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.
close with our benediction. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. May you go in the grace and the power of Christ this week to flee from a life of futility because you have been freed from a life of futility. God bless you. Have an awesome week.